Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that a genetic scorecard now could predict your risk of being obese. Researchers looked at more than 2.1 million genetic variants and created a genetic predisposition score that they think predicts whether you're likely to be severely obese. And in their study, they showed that weight differences came up as early as age three, and by age 18, if you had the highest genetic score, you weighed about 29 pounds more on average than those with the lowest scores. And if you had the highest score, you were also 25 times more likely to have severe obesity. And high scores were sadly associated with what you'd expect, increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and stroke. And a bunch of other people said, yeah, right, that doesn't really matter because you didn't account for lifestyle. For instance, maybe those genetic things are just your predisposition for French fries and gluten. <laughs> Anyhow, what we've all learned from the, the world of biohacking is that the environment around you turns those genes on and off. And there's some genes the environment won't affect because whether they're on or off, they do a certain thing. But for the most part, you can change all of that stuff and take it from me going from 300 pounds to about 200 pounds, depending on how much muscle I have at the time. I think you can overcome those genetic things. You just have to find out what works for you. It won't be the same thing that works for everyone, but there's some basic rules you can follow. Now, today's guest is a guy who runs the most popular and powerful online health site there is. He's been doing it since 1997. He's inspired many millions of people to look at the way they manage their lives, to look at their health, to pay attention to many of the things that we now take for granted in the world of functional medicine. He's an osteopathic physician and just realized we can improve ourselves and has been fearless in talking about what works. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Joseph Mercola of famed Mercola.com fame. He's a, a dear friend and just a, a great guy. Uh, Dr. Mercola, welcome to the show. Hey, it's so great to be with you today, Dave. I'm recording this episode uh, with Dr. Mercola because he just finished speaking at the sixth annual biohacking conference. And the conference is something that I, I started in San Francisco with 100 people we had more than a thousand people uh, this year at the conference talking about stuff that works in the body, and uh, Dr. Mercola just completely, uh, completely rocked the audience by talking about uh, some of the things that you've heard on the show, things like hydrogen, things like EMFs, and other stuff like fasting and ketosis, and things that that you may know if you're a longtime listener, and if not. And Dr. McCullough is a world-renowned expert on this stuff, and we're going to go deep today. So super happy you're, you're back on the show, even though you're just off stage. Yeah, well, I want to thank you so much for having me at the event. Uh, it was literally the best event I ever intended in my entire life. Wow. Without, without any question, nothing came close. It was like putting 10 Christmases in one weekend, literally. <laughs> and even that is an understatement. I mean, literally, it changed my life in, in many ways. I mean, uh, one of the biggest is I, I met Dr. Barry, Dr. Barry Morgulin. Oh. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm actually committing to his program because of you. Wow, Joe, that makes me so happy. Uh, I love it that you're going to try it, Joe. I have had results from that that I cannot explain using Western yeah. medicine, but there's something going on there that's real. Now, you just wrote a book called Keto Fast, where you talk mm -hmm. about ketogenic stuff and also timing this this idea maybe you don't want to eat after dark we've had sachin panda on the show but you put together a book based on your knowledge as a physician and your just deep research for decades and uh, maybe we, we start with what did you learn from writing keto fast well my first book or not my first book i think i've written a dozen now but the previous book on this topic was Fat for Fuel, which describes a program to uh, obtain metabolic flexibility and help teach your body to start reburning fat for fuel. Most of your listeners are probably there already, but clearly about 85% of the U.S. population is not. So it, it was somewhat targeted for the general population. So after finishing that, and you know, I wrote that after uh, it was catalyzed by my journey and seeking to finally understand and integrate this in my own life. But then I, I, I was fascinated with the benefits of 
of multiple day water fasting. And uh, at the time, be, before I committed to writing the book or when I committed to, I thought that I would write the book about how to implement successfully a, a multiple day water fast, typically five days. Because I had done it three or four times before I did the book and I thought this was, th this was really important to do. And what I realized after doing the research is that there was probably not a good strategy for almost everyone yeah. for, a no for a number of reasons. Well, there's a number of good reasons why it is beneficial and has been beneficial historically for many, many centuries. It probably for time immemorial, it's a, it's a, it's a crucial part of nearly every major religion on the planet uh, for spiritual reasons, but also for health reasons. And you've got to know that practices like that would not persist unless there was some benefit for them. So there clearly is a benefit to doing this. But, it, but what I realize is that we live in the 20th century. And in the 20th century, 21st century, sorry, we used to live in the 21st century. But uh, in the 20th century, and certainly extending the 21st, there was the uh, development of all these toxins, uh, industrial chemicals, at least 80,000 and more. Many of them have never been studied for toxicity, let alone synergistic toxicity from having combinations of these things. And most of these chemicals are fat soluble, which means they eventually get stored in your fat cells. And when you're doing a multiple day water fast, you are liberating these toxic chemicals. And that's all well and good, unless you have too many of them and your detoxification systems aren't up to the challenge of, of biochemically modifying those toxins so that they can be uh, essentially uh, changed and effective and eliminated and excreted from your body. So when you do this multiple day water fasting, I think you're getting too many because of the, the, the toxic exposures that we now have. And you also don't have the fuel and the nutrients you need for your liver to properly process them, which is why I think keto fast or a partial fast, which is a hybrid of a few different systems. Uh, Kristen Veraday's alternate day fast, she's a professor at the University of Illinois, maybe associate professor. And then uh, M Michael Mosley did the, uh, no, well, actually he did his thing to the 5-2, but it was also, um, uh, Walter Longo's work on the fasting mimicking diet. So I, I hybridized those together and to a program that I thought is re relatively easy and simple to understand and follow, and yet reap the the, the most important benefits that you would, would achieve by multiple day water fasting. I love your mindset, and, and we, we both think that way. Um, it has to be something you're going to actually do <laughs> because if it requires mm -hmm. you to you know, go to the top of the Himalayas and stand on one leg while you do it, the friction to get there isn't, isn't going to happen. Uh, so the pragmatic approach to getting most of the benefits but experiencing way less of the disruption in your life and the pain, that's the holy grail for people who actually have things we want to do. Uh, so walk me through how you do this multiple day variant on water fast. And I want to share with you and with listeners uh, what I've been doing, and let's talk about the pros and cons of these different things. Okay, well, like I said, it's a, it's a variant of the fasting mimicking diet, uh, but which is a thousand calories the first day, and then uh, about seven hundred calories the next four days. So it's uh, a little bit different than that, and it's all and it's basically you're using your own food, so it's a lot less expensive than a six hundred dollar prolon pro prolon program, but the way that you do it is you first have to become metabolically flexible, and most people. Yeah. Uh, listening probably are, but if you aren't, then the single most important strategy, and the one that I emphasize in every lecture I give now, is to compress your eating window to six to eight hours. And what I've realized, actually, as I was doing my own keto, fa keto fast question and answer session, is that we sleep for eight hours, Dave, right? Except for you, six and a half hours with your, <laughs> your massively improved stem cell makeover, that you're able to do that. But most of us most every other normal mortal humans are sleeping for eight hours if they want to get their maximum benefits. So why shouldn't we just eat for eight hours and then 16 hours put it, put it at rest? Now, I tend to go a little bit longer, not only eat in a six-hour window, but maybe it's eight hours. So six to eight hours is the window. And once you're doing that, you, you really get just, just doing that and not even paying attention to the quality of the food is going to provide you with enormous benefits. But if you, you're doing that, you're going to become metabolically flexible unless you're seriously metabolically impaired, two, 300 pounds overweight, you know, or maybe even a hundred, but you know, then it's take, going to take a little longer. And the way you know you're flexible is that you, you can look at your ketones and the most accurate way is measuring them in your blood. And when you're able to generate physiologically useful levels of ketone, which is usually about 0.3 to 0.5 millimoles, 
then you know you're flexible and then you can do this. So what is the program? But by the way, before we get into the program, uh, some people might not know what that 0.3 to 0.5 is and the significance. I, I want to walk through that real quick. Sure. Most of the the keto bro uh, kind of cultures, like, my ketones are higher than yours. I got them up to 3.5 or whatever, um, which is sort of like saying my blood glucose is higher than yours. You know, <laughs> and the fact you have that all these energy molecules floating around that your body didn't suck into your cells might mean that you have a problem. But 0.3 to 0.5 is is not considered nutritional ketosis by most people, but it has these massive effects on hunger hormones and it has these other effects on your satiety hormones. And there's a couple different studies uh, that are in both my books. I think you also have the same uh, research in your last book, if I remember right. But that's a magic number and you can get there via a variety of ways. All right, so so given that context, this is low grade ketosis. This isn't like the monster ketosis that some people. No, might be no, it doesn't about. have to be that high. And that's a very good point that you bring up, Dave, because there there are some challenges with that. And and as you become more metabolically efficient, your tissues indeed are able to utilize those ketones. So you su you suck them up, and they, they're not floating around your blood. So actually, your blood ketones will be have lower levels. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's worse. I mean, it's very very hard for me to get my ketones over three. I mean, I have to fast for many days to do that. I mean, I typically don't fast for more than a day. Well, the, the keto fast, which I'm about to describe. Yeah. But even when I take like 50 grams of exogenous uh, ketone esters, the, the uh, you know, it's, it's hardly- stuff that tastes like gasoline, right? Yeah. So anyway, you get your metabolically flexible as determined by blood ketone levels, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. So You've got this restricted eating window. In my case, it's 9 a.m. To, to 3 p.m. Maybe it's 10 to 4, 10 to 5. You know, it's in that range. So you've done it. Uh, you've eaten your, you, you've been doing this for a month and it, you wake up and it's, and then you, you get to nine o'clock in the morning or whatever your eating time is. And you would normally eat your regular meal. Well, instead of eating your regular meal, you have a very small meal. It's usually between three to 500 calories based on your lean body mass, which is about 3.5 times your lean body mass. And those calories are very specific calories. And I think this is the key. First of all, there's low carbohydrates, very low carbohydrates to yep. inhibit autophagy. So less than 10 grams, you know, essentially none almost. Um, and then the, the fat's actually low too, but it's only low because you want to keep the calories low because high calories will, will activate, auto will inhibit autophagy. So and the bulk of the, the calories though, by volume certainly is protein, but it's a very specific type of protein. It may be 30, 40, or maybe even a little more grams of protein, which is quite significant. But I think it's useful because it's going to give the fuel that your, your liver primarily requires to facilitate the detoxification process. But the proteins are really low levels of branched-chain amino acids. And mm -hmm. a good example of that would be collagen protein or bone broth, <laughs> you know, which has lot, mostly glycine proline, hydroxyproline, very low branch chains. And it's almost yep. the ideal form. I, and I use fermented chlorella, which is not doesn't have the glycine, but it's still as low in the branch chains. And uh, we have a vegan protein powder that I use also, which is also very low in branch chains. So I have like 40 grams of that one meal, and that's the meal for the day. And uh, then you don't eat for 24 hours. So essentially, the next day, you wake up and it'll be like, four, by the time you eat the next meal, you'll be at least 42 hours where you've only had three to 500 calories. And a number of things will occur in that that are, that are they're physiologically significant. One is that you will maximally activate autophagy, maybe not maximally, but close to, to, to max, you know, it might be 80, 85%, because you, you'll get, probably get more in a multiple day water fast, but not significantly more, especially considering the downsides. So a few other things will happen. Typically, you'll lose weight. I lose about four pounds of weight every time I do it. And most all of it's water because you're depleting your glycogen stores, and your glycogen requires water to be stored. So when you're burning it, you're going to you're going to urinate the water out, and you're going to lose weight. So it's not mu lean muscle mass you're losing; it's primarily water. But then you'll also have increased, radically increased your growth hormone levels by two to three hundred percent, which is a profoundly important physiological benefit that you can absolutely take advantage is, of. Is that the collagen or the fast that's doing that? No, that's the fast. Okay. It's the fast. It's, it, fat, that's an artifact of fasting. It does a lot of other good things. Right, it increases right. DPH, it increases NAD+, and I can tell, tell you about the, about the mechanisms if you're interested. But anyway, so your growth hormone is elevated. It's, it's not typically a problem. It's not like injecting growth hormone because when your growth hormone is elevated from fasting, your growth hormone receptors are inhibited. So you don't get the active, you don't get the increase in IGF-1. 
but you still have elevated growth hormones. So that when you wake up in the morning, you can do a strength training workout and you can just crush it, absolutely crush it in a fasted state. And then when you get home or you're, you know, when you're finished with your workout, as soon as you can, then you feast and you ha- and you activate mTOR. You go into a, an, an anabolic phase where you it have lots of branched chain amino acids, glutamine, uh, colostrum, things that would really build your tissue up and, and carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, healthy carbohydrates like fruit will raise your insulin levels, it will decrease AMPK, they'll activate mTOR. And uh, the branch chains will also act for it. Because there's a number of different ways you can activate mTOR. And you just don't want to do it with one way. Do it with multiple ways, and that, then you can get maximal activity. Yeah. I, I wrote about something. I, I, called it, uh, I, get, I called it either stacking mTOR or, or tripling down on mTOR. Yeah. Uh, because the way mTOR works, and you want mTOR to build muscle tissues. Uh, this is for, for people listening if you haven't heard about mTOR. Uh, you need it in order to... Uh, build muscle, but if it's chronically elevated by oh. eating too much animal protein oh. all the time, you're not going to like what happens. It's really bad for you. So it should be low most of the time and then spike, you get muscles and then it goes back to low. Yeah. And and that's what Dr. McCall is talking about here. What uh, the three things that work to really push mTOR down, what you want to do is, is push it down. It's like a spring. You load it up, you load it up, you load it up, and then uh, you let the spring go and it spikes. So fasting suppresses mTOR so it'll spike back up. Coffee is shown in studies to suppress mTOR, and exercise does that. Mm -hmm. So what Dr. McCullough is describing here uh, is uh, is very similar to that idea of uh, tripling down on on your mTOR. And you do all those things, and working out in a fasted state, the way he just said, it's profound because I would say before before the workout, have some coffee. Of oh, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't get to that yeah. part, but I'll Oh, you I'll didn't know you have that in there as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then bam, the mTOR goes up and yeah, you do put muscle on better. Uh, and I love you. You mentioned glutamine, but glutamine will take you right out of ketosis, right? Well, yeah, but do you do this after the workout? Exactly. You're okay yeah. to go yeah. out of ketosis because you just yeah. worked out, right? So all the supplements, as I said, glutamine, branched chain amino acids, fruit, you don't do those in the fasting phase. You do those after yep. you, you've worked out. But you're absolutely right. Coffee is so beneficial because it's full of polyphenols. Now, mm-hmm. healthy coffee, of course, because you don't want the toxins and you know the kind that you promote and full of micro, free of mycotoxins and other things. So, but there's other polyphenols like raw cacaonibs, yeah. EGCG from green tea, mm-hmm. and I, I use a wild apple from that's harvested from Europe that is even, has much even higher concentrations of EGC and, and other similar polyphenols. And then I like the pomegranate. Uh, peels, you know, most people know yeah. pomegranates are healthy, but the peels actually has 90% of the polyphenols. And there's two really good ones in there, elagic acid and elagrotannins. And when you eat them, your microbiome converts them to urolithin A, which is a powerful, powerful mitophagy benefit. It's, yeah. it, these pomegranate peel powders are some of the most profound polyphenols out there in my view. Uh, what, what's really cool, you can get a, a Viome test, and Naveen Jain was also on yeah, stage yeah, yeah, sure. uh, at the Bulletproof Conference, and he found that about 30% of people don't have the bacteria in their gut to metabolize elagic acid, which comes from uh, pomegranates or from raspberries. Uh, and so if you have that test, it actually tells you whether you're going to be able to convert that. And I would imagine, although we don't have the evidence yet, that if you take that stuff regularly, you'll actually grow the mm-hmm. microbiome that can do that. Uh, which is also interesting. So if it was never present in your diet, why would you have bacteria that could do it? So this is one of those ways you, you change your gut bacteria to be healthy if you take that stuff regularly. And um, I, I like the apple polyphenols as well. These are important things. And you, you're bringing up something that, that kind of annoys me uh, about fasting. There are some purists who say, well, the lab studies on rats were done with water only. <laughs> no, Therefore, we can only do water in our fast. And here's, here's the thing. This is in the, the Bulletproof Diet in 2014. Something called fasting-induced adipose factor, uh, or FIOF. And your liver makes this stuff, and when you're fasting, it says, oh, burn extra fat, and when you have extra carbs present, it says store extra fat. Unfortunately, your microbiome wants to make sure that the walking Petri dish that is you, from, from your gut's perspective, it wants to make sure that you have extra fat and that you're not going to run out of energy. So it'll amplify your FIOF levels, and... What does the good bacteria in the gut eat? The stuff that keeps you thin? It eats polyphenols. So I don't know, but when I'm doing my, quote, water fast, do I want to have green tea? Do I want to have coffee? Do I want to have polyphenols that don't have substantial amounts of carbohydrates or protein present? I think that there's a great argument for it, and I feel better and perform better when I do it. So I I love it that you're calling that out, too, because water-only fasting isn't necessary. There's 
it's better to do it with tea or coffee uh, or cacao even than you know, not. Small amounts of you know protein that's not going to activate yeah. it. So I, that's the conclusion I reach after reviewing the literature. It, it's really clear if you seriously investigate this. But there's other polyphenols too. You've got curcumin. You've got berberine, yep. quercetin. You know, and there's and there's probably another half a dozen I'm not thinking of right now. But those, but here's the thing, David. This is what I figured out actually even after I sent the, the draft of the book to the publisher, is that autophagy, and I'm pretty confident this is true, is not something you want to activate all the time. No, no. No, no. So, and I would be taking these polyphenols like nightly, like when I went to bed when I was activating through an intermittent fast, but then I realized, no, not a good strategy, and I'm only doing it twice a week. So I take all these polyphenols when I do the partial fast, when I really upregulate autophagy twice a week. So, and I take it in the, I take it before I go to bed, where I've had like 30 hours of the fast and when I wake up because I'm still not going to eat for another four to five, six hours. So I get two blasts of the polyphenol at hit at activating autophagy. There's going to be over the next 10 years, this huge amount of science that looks at which polyphenols do what and which combinations of polyphenols do what for you based on what gut bacteria you have present yeah. and based on what genetics you have. And th this is an incredibly complex data science thing to unpeel. We can only do it with big data and with the ability to measure all of those things. So when we have enough human genomes, enough gut bacteria genomes, and enough of this, it's the same thing we've been doing for the past 80 years with amino acids. What does amino acid number one do? What does tryptophan do? What does tyrosine do? What does glutamine do? And then, oh, what happens if you put two of these together? And then there it's even more complex because if you glue two of them together into a di or a tripeptide like collagen, the tripeptides in collagen do something different than the amino acids in collagen. And you go down this rat hole of complexity, but what you've done in keto fast and even just some of the basic principles of the Bulletproof diet, only have fat in the morning in order to extend that effect of that break fast because even though you got energy, you didn't activate any insulin, you didn't activate any uh, protein digestion. All those things are the very beginnings of what we're starting to learn about what these, these big variable in our environment, the food is going into our body. And when someone talks to me about calories, I just kind of, I just kind of want to laugh. I'm like what kind of calories? I mean, candle wax is full of calories, but I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. sure it's different than drinking gasoline, which is also full in calories. They're just not all the same. You can't even think about it that way. Cause it's, it's like below reader's digest level of simplicity of things about nutrition, but your doctor still says calories. All right, so I'll get off my soapbox. You already know all this stuff, but. No, but it's important to repeat it for the listeners, and there's no question. And I really greatly appreciate your, your being a leader and helping uh, the community understand this because not many people are teaching this. And, you know, you, you really, that's what I really, really value about your, your approach and your ability to network with individuals who understand this at a deep level because it's hard to tease out. You know, it really isn't really isn't there. But the, the two other polyphenols that are important that I forgot were, oh, yeah. were fisetin and uh, resveratrol. The other two. What about apigenin? Is that in it for you as well? Apigenin is an interesting one. It is uh, it is useful. It's hard to get in high concentrations. Fisetin you can get pretty high, you can get milligram quantities. It is, it's hard to get milligram quantities of apigenin. Typically, I guess you can, but I've, I haven't found a really good source of it. But it's, it, it inhibits CD38. And CD38 is an enzyme that's outside your cells and is the one of the biggest extracellular consumers of NAD+. And interestingly, so that you th would theoretically increase NAD+, if you, if, you know, if it worked. I mean, that's what Sinclair believes in a lot of others. But here's the cool thing. Actually, I was just, I'm reading Sinclair's new book that comes out in a few months and just read this this morning because I didn't realize the mechanism. But we know that fasting will increase your NAD plus levels by 30%. So, you know, the need for epigenin is kind of diminished. If you're already increasing it by 30%, why do you need to do that? Uh, so, and you know, the mechanism is that it, it, it upregulates the rate limiting enzyme uh, in the salvage pathway. So uh, essentially the converting nicotinamide back to NAD and that's NAMPT, that enzyme. So that's how, that's how fasting works, which is an interesting way. Now, fisetin's available in, in capsules. I, I use it in a couple of the formulations I, I've created, and I've taken fisetin for a very long time. I think the most common source is seaweed or strawberries, if I'm remembering right. No, I think most of it, I, I thought it was called fisetin. But, oh, fisetin, uh, yeah, I could, yeah. Yeah, but the, um, the primary source is from some Australian pine tree. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, in food, the highest source is strawberries. Uh, yeah. 
but oh, the supplements don't come from strawberries. Yeah, no, they do right not. About that. They do not. I there, I could never find a source that wasn't from this Australian pine needles. So, but interestingly, it has a very poor absorption fisetin. And so I, do you know how I take my, my fisetin? I was do, I doing intrarectal fisetin. You know, I'm, I'm just going to have to say this, <laughs> Dr. McCullough. That's gross. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> guys, listen, IVs work really well. IVs in, require a needle going into your vein. If you take certain nutrients and you put them in, not your mouth, the other end with the right things, they will absorb as well as an intravenous nutrient and it's cheaper and less painful. So Dr. McCullough is not alone in uh, in this. So do do tell. Do you have a recipe? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I can share it with you. But the fisetin has very poor oil absorption. And I use the same strategy. There's two nutrients I take uh, transmucosally because the, the, the rectum is full of mucosa, which has essentially very similar absorption rates as intravenous. Not quite, but you know, close to 80 90%. So the uh, other nutrient I use is nicotinamide riboside. And I, that's mm -hmm. my favorite Nick NAD plus precursor in addition to niacin, which is like dirt cheap. Uh, and I take pretty much every day, but only 25 to 50 milligrams, a small, small amount. Uh, not certainly, you know, larger than that, uh, because that's about what you normally lose per day in the salvage pathway. But nicotinamide riboside is actually an interesting nutrient because it's it's natural. I mean, it's in breast milk. So this thing is not some exogenous, crazy chemical. It's totally natural. Yeah. And you, you interviewed Charles Brenner before who was actually at your event and I attended his presentation. Yeah. So I talked to Brenner after his presentation. I specific, cause I, I was trying to ask him and he, he wouldn't pick on me for whatever reason. But anyway, I, I, I cornered him after the presentation and I said, listen, what do you think about, you know, if you swallow NR orally, there's no question about it. The vast majority of it's going to be methylated by your liver. That's why the NAD plus levels are really high in your liver after NR. Now, you do get some other systemic benefit, but it's, I think it's minimized because of the methylation process. So I said, what do you think about using it uh, transmucosally through the rectum? And he just like, well, I never thought of that. Or just like, I don't know. Who's going to do it rectally, you know? So he, he had no clue about it. And, and just for people listening, we're talking about something the size of a pencil eraser. It, it, it's not like a, a horrible, no, no, yeah. uncomfortable sort of a thing. Yeah. And so I'll tell you the, the, how I do this. So you buy the raw materials. You get it, And there's a number of companies that sell NR. Uh, and Fisogen is available from a number of companies. So you just get it and you put in one normal dose, an oral dose. And the way you do it is you get a candy mold on Amazon uh, that's made out of silicone. And the one I use is, I don't forget the name of it, but it has 66 wells. And the, and the actual mold looks like an inverted candy, uh, Hershey's Kiss. You know, so it's <laughs> I thought you were going to say Christmas tree for a minute there. I was no, 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 no. It's a can <laughs> Hershey's Kiss. And about the same size as a Hershey's Kiss. So that's a, maybe a little smaller because uh, it doesn't have as wide a base. It's more of a cylinder. And uh, it's a candy mold, actually. So and you fill it up with you melt some coconut oil. Uh, and in the summer, if you're listening to this, it won't be an issue because it's usually a liquid at room temperature. But if it's winter or cold, then you have to heat it up and you pour it into the well and then maybe halfway and then you open the capsule and put it into the well and then you fill it up with coconut oil again and you fill all the wells up and then you put it in the refrigerator. Now, you know, my time's a little bit too valuable for me to do this. So I pay someone to do that for me. Uh, and then, and then you keep it refrigerated and then I do it twice a day. Not, not the fisetin. I only use the fisetin because it's a polyphenol during, during uh, the fasting, but the, the NR I use every day and, uh, twice a day and just do it interactively. The, the key here though, there is a cylinder. So you don't want to, you would think you'd put the pointy in, in first, but you actually put the base of it in first. Otherwise it tends to pop out. You, you can also, uh, just on Amazon, you can search for a suppository mold and have little things that are designed with more of a teardrop shape. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll work too. I yeah, just like I'm just like for for people listening who are going, wait a minute, are you serious? But bottom line is, if you get maybe ten or twenty times better absorption that way than you do from swallowing the pill, let's talk about money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you want to spend twenty times more and swallow twenty times more supplements, or do you want to be really effective on that? Well, front? it's not even just the economics. I mean, because there may be some concern about the m m metabolites of this stuff. We just don't know, especially with with some of the polyphenols. You know, or even NR, who knows what methylated NR is going to do? I mean, we don't, the, the studies have never been done. So we're in new, new territory. But we know that NR itself, as it gets into your system systemically, is really safe and, and highly beneficial because it will increase your NAD plus levels. And there's lots of studies on NAD, on NAD, NR 
benefits, even not used transmucosally. So you mix uh, coconut oil? I've used cacao butter or coconut oil. Yeah, either um, one will work. They, and then you put it in the freezer so that it's cold enough that it solidifies. And, and both of those, cacao is interesting because it melts at exactly the temperature of your body, which is why chocolate has that cool, when it's real chocolate made with wax, um, it has that kind of cool mouthfeel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then coconut oil melts at a lower temperature than your body, yeah. so it has to be relatively cool, otherwise the whole thing gets liquidy. So I, I prefer cacao butter uh, with yeah, a little bit that of coconut would, that oil. Would, that's a good uh, improvement in the system. It's a little pricier than coconut oil, and uh, you almost always have to heat it to put it in there. So, But it, it would, it's a more elegant solution, there's no question. I will admit I, uh, I don't do most of my vitamins that way, but I certainly, uh, like things like SOD and catalase, uh, which are uh, important for dealing with excessive free radicals after flying and things like that. Um, I have no problem with transmucosal delivery systems, we'll put it that way. But uh, it, there may be some supplements where you wouldn't want to do this uh, because your levels could get too high and even be unsafe. So I, I would just encourage anyone who's thinking about doing this, don't go out there and take everything in your vitamin cabinet or even worse, your pharmaceutical cabinet and blend it all up because you're you're playing with it. You need to know that it's okay to have a high dose of it and just you know be be careful and, and pay attention. Yeah, I would caution you to re, reconsider the SOD and catalase. Those are two important antioxidants. SOD for for is a dismutase for superoxide to transmute it into uh, hydrogen peroxide. Then catalase to take to take the peroxide to water, or well, yeah, water ideally. So. The danger of doing that is those are really important signaling molecules, and you're kind of playing with fire in my view. And the better way, to, I believe, is to upregulate the, them hormetically. And there's some very elegant ways to do that, the best probably being um, molecular hydrogen. More, more so than ozone therapy. Interesting. All right. I, 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 ozone may, but I have not, I'm not familiar with it. it in my, I just haven't studied the perspective, but there's a l- number of intriguing molecules Biological molecules will do it. Molecular hydrogen is one. Uh, and then you've got sulforaphane, which of course is uh, from from broccoli, broccoli sprouts. Uh, but it, it not only upregulates the NRF2 pathway, but it does something really intriguing that we're gonna talk about, which is one of the other benefits of fasting. And maybe we can delve off here. Well, I think we need to tell people what SOD and catalase are, uh, just because I think people say, what what the heck is going on here? And I have, like, I have a, too much SOD... Uh, horror story as well. So why don't you, you share what SOD and catalase are, what they do, and then we'll talk about how to manage oxidative stress. Well, they're essentially antioxidants and mostly produced in your mitochondria because that's where they're mostly made because most of the superoxide is produced in the mitochondria. It's an artifact of transferring the electrons through the electron transport chain. And th- that's part of the process. And normally, interestingly, this is an interesting side effect or tangent, is that if you're metabolically healthy like you and I are, most of your listeners, you're gonna you're gonna gen, not you don't it's not a perfect transfer of those electrons from your food to energy. You're gonna leak about three to five percent of the electrons out, and they'll they'll develop superoxide, which SOD superoxide dismutase transmutes to hydrogen peroxide, and then the peroxide is 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 neutralized by catalase to water. So th- that occurs normally in a mitochondria, but if you're metabolically inflexible and you're primarily getting your food for, and most of your calories from carbs, especially unhealthy carbs, then you're gonna generate, instead of three to 5%, you might generate 40% more, so you have increased oxidative stress just burning your fuel for energy, which is crazy. That's, you know, oxidative stress is, is a prescription for disaster, unnecessary oxidative stress, you need some because uh, they, they're really important biological signaling molecules, which is why I get back to the other argument, why taking exogenous antioxidants like SOD or catalyst may not be a wise strategy, because you, you're, you're like playing God almost, and you're fig- trying to figure this thing out. Rather have, you, my approach is to let your body figure out if you need it by getting, giving these biological molecules. See, because molecular hydrogen just, just doesn't inc- fr- frivolously increase your SOD or catalase or, re- or glutathione. It assesses exactly what set what what the parameters are of your biological damage, and if you need it, if you have excessive oxidative stress, it will dissociate from the keep one protein, which gets it active and it dis- goes into their DNA, activates the antioxidant response amounts, the ARE genes, and will help your body make those an- antioxidants almost instantaneously. So you you've got it right where you need it, in the cells, in the mitochondria, so that you can neutralize that oxidative stress. So that I, I think. I think it's wise to let your body do the, do, the, do the heavy lifting rather than you try to micromanage it. 
I, I very much appreciate and support that perspective. Healthy mitochondria ought to be able to make enough antioxidants to handle, handle their own stuff. Uh, when I was 300 pounds and I had serious metabolic derangement uh, for a variety of reasons, including uh, the time I was a raw vegan for a while, and not to mention toxic mold exposure and heavy metals and eating lots of the wrong foods and all the other stuff. But uh, I did find you know, antioxidants like those were helpful. And, and as I got metabolically healthy, I said, you know, I'm going to try suppressing SOD and take some uh, some supplements that are specifically targeted at SOD. So I did this for four days. And I have not felt that wrecked in so long because when you don't have enough free radicals generated by your mitochondria, they downregulate their function. So within four days, I, I felt like I was making a third as much energy as I should. And I, I mean, I really was just, man, I have to put one foot in front of the other today, which is not <laughs> my characteristic state. So I don't take those, those supplements uh, at all, except after I fly, you have a very large spike in free radical production uh, that isn't really good. Um, I found that a relatively low dose transmucosal uh, SOD and catalase does make a difference for me, but only uh, on a functional use when I knew I just did something unnatural to my biology. You know, taking a long flight is, is not good for you. Um, but potentially, if I was breathing hydrogen or doing some other hydrogen stuff, maybe I wouldn't even need to do that. But it, yeah. it's been working for me so far. But it's you know once it's a one, week. One way to do that, but I, th I, I let me seek to upgrade your flying. Yeah, tell me uh, remediation because it's an issue for most of us. And I'm you know I I, I fortunately travel about once a month on average. Oh. Yeah, let, let's have a whole like ten minutes where we both talk about the best cellular level travel hacks and all the other stuff. I, I, I want to compare notes with you. I've been to do this for years. Let's, okay, let's do it. I, I think I've got it. You well, go first. first of all, let me tell you the David Wolf strategy doesn't work and just fly at night because I've taken a nah. a, a meter up there, a, a Geiger counter, and it's it's the same level at night and at the daytime. So the, yeah. the, the earth isn't going to shield you from the sun's rays. It's, it's pervasive. So it is, it's ionizing radiation up there. It's gamma rays at 35,000 feet, very similar to, to x-rays, not as high a dose. It's, it's a fracture. It's, it, depending on how long you fly, it could be the equivalent of one chest X-ray. Uh, CAT scans are about 200 chest X-rays. So th whatever we're talking about for remediation of flying damage is also crucial, crucial, critical, vital that you, if for whatever reason you need a CAT scan, you've got to implement this strategy. Otherwise, you are going to get damaged and it's very severely. No question about it. Because we're talking about uh, mitigating ionizing radiation damage. So what happens during this? There's the, the, what, it, what happens is it, the ionizing radiation damages your body in two ways, or your DNA primarily, which is what we're concerned about. The, it, can do, it has enough energy to directly break the DNA covalent bonds, uh, either single or double-stranded breaks. But that's not the way most of it gets done. It gets done by, by creating, by hitting the water in the cell, in the nucleus, spinning off hydroxyl free radicals, and the hydroxyl free radicals are what bust the, the bonds. So you get direct and indirect damage, and that's what, that's what has to be repaired. Now, thank God your body has a system designed to repair this. And this is, you, it, you may not have heard this before, Dave, but the system is called PARP, P-A-R-P, poly ADP ribose polymerase. But what yep. PARP do? This is so cool. PARP, I don't know if you know that NAD plus embedded within that molecule is ADP. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yep. what PARP does, it, it sucks out the ADP from NAD+, not just from one NAD+, from about 150 molecules of NAD+, and it creates this matrix of, of, uh, of uh, ribose polymer, pol pol polymers that essentially creates a framework so the DNA repair enzymes can come in and repair that damage. So you've lost 150 NAD molecules of NAD for every strand you bust. So it would make sense, and, and there's no question about that this PARP, de this PARP depletion of NAD is the single largest consumer of NAD+. Plus. So the, I think one of the primary strategies is to replenish NAD. And previously, I was using the NR recommendation, but I was upgrading it because I was actually using NAD. Uh, up until earlier this year, I didn't was not a fan of NAD IV or uh, other, other methods to get interested. I love this stuff. But, but that's because I was unaware of a transport mechanism and I couldn't find it in literature, but, but James Clement kindly showed me where it was and yeah. isn't NAD plus transporter to get it in the cell? Cause it's a charged molecule. It won't get in spontaneously. It has to have a transporter and the transporter is connection 53 and it gets it into the cell. So now I'm a big fan and I used to use these patches 
you know, uh, the battery patches that you put on your skin. But I learned from your, the co-founder of Upgrade Labs, Martin Tobias, he took me aside, you know, one of these in the call. I know we, we, he's, uh, he's the, the president and CEO, but I founded it a couple of years before I hired oh, him. Oh, okay. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm that's sorry. okay. I, I, just, I just didn't remember it correctly. But anyway. No, that's okay. It just for so, people so listening, yeah. He's a cool guy. It was, it was great to meet him. So he pulled me aside and told me the details that you had talked to the apothecary, or apothecary the Archway apothecary. Yeah. Uh, and now have a buffered NAD solution that you can inject sub Q. And that is clearly the best way to go. So, you know, like 0.1 cc sub Q of NAD buffered solution that's stable for months. It's like, wow, that is the, the, the best way to do it. And then the other one is really cool. Uh, uh, and it, the, another reason why I do partial fasting or keto fasting when I fly. So if I'm like, I'm going to fly to Austin on Wednesday uh, or Thursday. So I will do a partial fast on Wednesday and I will not eat Thursday. So I'm, I'm going to go in into Austin 40 hour fast. High ketone levels do a number of things. They increase NADPH. On one of our previous uh, interviews, you had, we were talking about mitochondria, you were describing mitochondria as the battery of the cell, but it really isn't the battery of the cell. The battery of the cell is NADPH. That's the, the reservoir of- Yeah, of it, it's the storage system. mechanism. I, I agree with you. Yeah, it's a storage. So you restore this, high, this reductive potential that can recharge your antioxidants like glutathione and, you know, and when, all the other ones that you need. And- High ketone esters will do that, and they're also really potent histone deacetylase inhibitors. So, if I'm going to have a, if I'm flying, I like to have my ketones two or three, and that's that's the take time to take the ketone esters. So you can take a ketone esters. Uh, some I, I still haven't figured out the timing on this. You you could take it during your when you're flying, but some of Veach's, who's probably you've interviewed before. Yeah, Veach has been on the show. Yeah, so he's one of the world experts on this, and his his associate is Bill William Curtis. There's another cool guy. And the studies they published showed that if you do it, at least in rats, if you do it 24 hours after the ionizing radiation exposure, it obliterated almost all the damage. So that's what I'm doing now. It just makes it a little more convenient. I take the dose like after I land or the next day after I land. The other thing that's completely transformative for me, it comes from uh, Nick Foles, uh, the Super Bowl MVP, who's, who's a friend who's been on the show and just an just amazing human being. I've worn compression socks for a long time when I fly because the evidence is pretty strong about that. And he's like, Dave, now you got to try the compression pants. Ah. And I'm like, really? And so I texted him like, all right, tell me the brand because I bought some that didn't work on Amazon. And, and he told me, uh, I don't have any deal with these guys, but he told me, take the try the two XU ones. They're the best ones I've found. Uh, but just that's not a, like there's no commercial anything there. Uh, so I, I bought those and I said, all right, that works. So then I went and I started testing compression shirts. So if you see me on an airplane and I look particularly ripped, it's because I'm wearing a full si a full body, basically from my ankles um, on the pants, you know, all the way up to your midriff. And then I have a compression shirt as well. And I wear it for several hours after I fly. And the reason I think this is so important is that electrons move around inside your cells and your cells swell up when you're at high pressure. Well, when there's no room for them to swell up, they don't swell up. So your electron transport is noticeably improved just because the cells can't get bigger. And I'm telling everyone listening, if you go out and spend, it's gonna cost you about 100, and, 100 bucks for a good pair of compression pants, about 100 bucks, 125 bucks for a compression shirt. That's a lot of money. But if you do that and you wear that when you fly, when you get off the airplane, you will feel more like yourself than you possibly could imagine. And it actually works. Interesting. The, uh, the addition I would add to that is consider wearing uh, an EMF blocking shirt under that compression. I do that. Actually, I do that on top of the compression. So you do it on top of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah because of the wrinkles yours, get annoying. So I, I have to wear it underneath. I made mine myself with a sewing machine. So, you know, I, <laughs> So now we're, we're we're seriously exposing the level of geeks that we are, Dr. Mercola. But I, um, yeah, I just I bought a T-shirt a while ago that that did that. I put that on over my compression shirt. But where I have my cell phone, uh, my cell phone's usually in airplane mode when it's on my body. You're more militant about that than I am. Um, but what I did find is that where my cell phone sits against my leg, I, I don't put it near my organs, so I put it on a on a pocket on my femur, basically. My right femur had 10% less bone density than my left femur where the phone is. So I'm like, damn it. So now I went out and I bought EMF blocking fabric and I sewed it all in on well, the inside of my pants where my cell phone sits. So if it's turned on and it's against my body, it's still getting blocked. Because 
maybe I'm just paranoid, but that 10% bone density was enough oh, to no. get my attention. Yeah, interesting. One of the, it reminds me of one of the amazing people in the audience at one of my presentations was uh, a part of OsteoStrong, who you've interviewed before, John. And, uh, yeah, John Jackwish. Yeah, I like John. He's been on the show. Yeah, so one of his associates in the UK was there, and he, he shared that, oh, I changed his life by watching my my video that I did on the beach. He moved from the UK to Spain. And so he's giving he's giving me an OsteoStrong. So I'm, he wants my bone density to be higher. So, you know, that OsteoStrong, I mean, it's an amazing machine. They're, not, they're few and far between, but boy, that can radically increase your bone density. Yeah, they have some kind of a, a like a franchise small business thing uh, there, there's great science in it. Uh, and when you, you look at all these little hacks like that, uh, or something else I'd, I'll do, I, I should mention for flying, um, I bring uh, one of the, the True Light. This is one of the companies I started, um, the one that makes the glasses, the True Dark glasses. Yeah, those are great. I love those, especially the new ones, the graded ones. Oh, the, the sunset ones? Yeah, yeah, those, yeah. Those are, by the way, my name's on the patent for those. Like I, I was like, this is a good idea because the angle of light coming in matters, and we tested it out, and it worked. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'll use the red light, and infrared light therapy uh, when I get back to my hotel room. I noticed that that also just really helps. It seems to help my sleep as well. Uh, so I, I'll tend to use that mostly over my organ systems. So you travel with that? Yeah, we, we have uh, one that's, it's a little panel. It's not particularly big. Okay, yeah, I, I think I saw it. It's like a, about the size of a small, 12 by 12 inches. Yeah, I think it's either 12 or 12 or 12 by 14 or 14 by 14. Dr. McCall, I, I, I mean, I'm interviewing people. I want to learn from you. And, and so I, I sometimes feel like, I don't want to talk too much on an episode, but here... Uh, I mean, you you have a great amount of knowledge, so it's kind of cool to swap notes with you. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, because you could, those are some really good hacks. I love it. I'm going to start doing them. Go for it. And, and I would just encourage everyone, look, you're listening to this going, what the heck are these? They're, they're injecting themselves. They're sticking stuff <laughs> wherever. And you don't have to do everything we do, but but we're ex- in, insanely curious people looking to live a very long time and feel really good and bring a lot of knowledge to the world and all that kind of stuff. And it just takes energy management. Uh, even if you're not a, a highly sensitive person like like I am, you know, I, I, I was pretty wrecked, so I would feel everything. Uh, and now I'm I'm highly resilient compared to anything I've ever been. But I know I know my weaknesses, and I know that with the amount I fly, every week I fly somewhere. I, I mean, I I am doing a level of flying that would shorten most people's lives, and still yeah. may shorten mine. But I'm doing that for a good cause. Well, uh, and. That means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to minimize every hit. If you fly once a year to Hawaii, you're going to do this because you want to feel good in Hawaii and get an extra day of quality vacation out of it. But if you do this every day for a living, you better know how to fly like a boss. <laughs> yeah, matters. yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, it's, it's well documented that flight crews have a 30% increased risk of cancer. So, yeah. and, it's, and it's primarily because they're not, they're not able to mitigate the oxidative stress, but those strategies are just magnificent. Ooh. One more for you. Yeah. You ready for this one? Yeah. Uh, so I, I make this uh, this box. I send out once a quarter. It's, it's a curated box of cool biohacking stuff. And I sent this out about maybe a year ago. It's a charcoal mask. Uh, and by the way, if you guys want to know all my cool biohacking little toys, it's uh, biohacked.com, B-I-O-H-A-C-K-E-D.com. So this is a, a curated box of goodies I send every quarter. But this charcoal mask, it's a little breathing mask, like something you'd wear at Burning Man. I have one in my bag. And I've only had to use it about five or six times. But there's something called a fume event on airplanes. And you'll usually get this uh, on the ground, but sometimes in midair, and we've all experienced it at probably one time, you smell a huge amount of jet exhaust mm-hmm. because the airplane sucked in its own exhaust when it was on the ground. Mm-hmm. Now, what they do with jet fuel is they insert uh, or they mix in a neurotoxin into the jet fuel. Thalic. And it's there for good cause because Thalic. it makes the jet fuel much less explosive. So the airplanes don't blow up as much. That's good for us. Uh, however, if you breathe that stuff, it wrecks you. And so mm-hmm. I, I noticed that on the times when this one happened, the entire flight, I'm trying to read, I'm trying to focus, and I'm just like in, like someone gave me a Valium or something. It, it just wrecks my brain, and I don't feel good for hours and hours. So that can happen, or hydraulic fluid can leak onto the, the compressors um, that are compressing the thin atmosphere during flight, and you smell this weird burn plasticky kind of smell. Yes, I put my mask on if I smell that stuff and I feel fine afterwards. And if I don't, I lose eight hours of productivity and God knows what my liver had to do with all that stuff. So I carry that, but I don't normally use it. That's a good strategy. I've, I've usually been packing a, a little personal air filter that secretes some ozone. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, and negative ions. I, I don't know that that would disrupt those, those chemicals, but probably the filter would be, the filtered mask would be better. 
It's one of those backup things. It's normally in the yeah. bag, but uh, also during forest fires, it's useful. So Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to call this the end of our first episode with Dr. Mercola, and we're going to continue the interview on the next episode of Bulletproof Radio. So thank you for listening to this one. If you loved this episode, I'd be grateful if you went to iTunes and just left a quick review that said Bulletproof Radio is awesome. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out Keto Fast, Dr. Mercola's new book, you should definitely order it. And I've got to make sure that I say this. If you value this kind of thing, leave a review. So review Dr. McCullough's book, review my books. Just take five seconds to go to Amazon. My personal thanks for doing that because as authors, we really notice and we value that. I will see you on the next episode where Dr. McCullough and I are going to talk about the other stuff he shared on stage at the biohacking conference. 